This past Sunday morning, the opening illustration of this sermon, I talked about watching Christmas movies. And uh, we've been doing a lot of that in my household here recently. And when we watch, uh, we've been watching on a, a flat panel television because that is the modern standard. Most folks now, your television, it's not really a special thing anymore. Most folks now, if you purchase a television, I'm not even sure if you can buy a tube TV anymore. Uh, maybe they sell them somewhere, but most places they're pretty much flat panel. However, for most of my life, and probably for most of you in here, the, the standard was the old tube television, a, a cathode ray tube as the formal name, but just a larger uh, tube television. Now, if you grew up watching one of those, your parents probably warned you at some point, don't sit too close to the TV, right? You, you heard that, I'm sure, at some point. But did you, ever, <laughs> did you ever go look at one up close? Raise your hand if you've done that before. If you've stuck your eye right up next to a, an old tube television. I'm sure some, I know some of you have done that before. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it caused any damage. They warned us not to do it. We did it anyway. Uh, if you look at a color tube television up close... It looks very different. You, you see the pixels that are there, uh, and the, there's the, the colors that are there, the red, green, and blue. It's a very different perspective. In fact, I remember as a kid wondering how in the world it turned out to be this picture that you could watch on television, when when you looked up close, it didn't look anything like that. It just looked like these little pixels there. But sometimes we can see different things when we look at something up close or when we zoom out uh, and look at a, a different perspective. And that's the point tonight of this mini-sermon, and it is a mini-sermon if you're wondering, uh, is this going to be a regular sermon? It's a shorter one. But this, this evening, the, the title of this, this uh, sermon is, is there before you. Uh, it's a slight variation from what's in your bulletin if you grabbed one. It's actually Christ and the Torah. Now, the series that we did over the last few weeks leading up to Christmas was Christ in the Torah. But here, it's Christ and the Torah. The Torah... Uh, generally referring to the Old Testament law, specifically the books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So we looked at Christ in the Torah, and we looked at uh, four texts over the last four Sundays that pointed us specifically to Jesus coming out of those first five books in the Bible. But tonight, we're zooming out a bit, much like when you look in at the old tube television and you zoom out, it looks different, you see a different perspective. So tonight we're considering the and, if you will, the, the whole of the Old Testament law and what that does for us. And what that does is it leads us or it points us to Christ. And that's the point of the text that Mark read uh, just a moment ago there in Galatians 3. Now I realize, uh, a disclaimer if you will, that this is a complicated topic and we're not going to solve uh, all the ins and outs of the Old Testament law for believers. What are we supposed to do with that? What are Christians supposed to do with the Old Testament law? We can't cover that in a mini-sermon, but what we can do is look at this passage and help be helped to understand one of the larger purposes of the Old Testament law. And that purpose is to lead us or to point us to Jesus Christ. That's one of the larger purposes because the law shows us our need for a Savior. That's what the law does in a sense, is it shows us that we need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ, who is our reason for celebrating this season, and in fact, our reason for gathering tonight. So that's one of the larger purposes there, and that's again in our passage tonight. So in this passage, uh, the Apostle Paul, the author, uses two primary analogies for the Old Testament law. In verse 23, uh, we see there, he says, But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. And so the analogy there is that of a, a jailer or a prison master. Some, something that's keeping us uh, confined or in jail. Then in verses 24 and 25, we read this, Therefore the law has become our tutor, or depending on your translation, it may say guardian or schoolmaster, something of that nature, disciplinarian. The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. And then in verse 25, 
Uh, But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. And so in the New American Standard, you have that word tutor there twice. Again, a different word used in other translations. It's difficult to convey in English what that word is. In the original Greek, uh, the word would be paedagogos. And basically what this person was, was a caretaker of the young. A slave that would take care of of, uh, young folks as they're growing up for a certain time period. And generally, the context or, or the, uh, the connotation of that word would be a harsh disciplinarian or a taskmaster. There was some instruction, so tutor in some sense conveys that there was some instruction that it was taking place, but this was not the primary instructor of someone for educational purposes. This was more someone who would teach manners, if you will, or someone who would keep you in line. Young children many times need to be kept in line. We all understand this, right? Children do their own thing. And so this was someone who would would be a caretaker of young folks and was, again, the, the, the idea there generally was that this person would be a harsh disciplinarian. So as we look at those two analogies, the jailer or the, the, the prison master and uh, this, this harsh disciplinarian, this, this guardian The law itself is not negative. We read that in other parts of Scripture. However, both of these analogies uh, have a a picture painted that is not positive. It's a picture of a stern taskmaster who keeps constant oversight and who disciplines constantly. So in other words, the law keeps us in line and it reminds us how much we fail. That's, that's part of the purpose. Again, not the entire purpose of the Old Testament law, but a big part of the purpose is to demonstrate or to show us how far we fall short. And that is part of the purpose. You say, why would God do that? Why would God do something or give a law that demonstrates that? Well, in part, He's revealing His righteous character. And as He's doing it, He's showing us that we cannot meet God's righteous standards. If we trace out the Old Testament law, and we look at all the provisions, and then if we understand that sin is more than just external, if we recognize that sin is not just those things that we do, but actually if we read something like the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus Christ's exposition, if you will, on the Ten Commandments, or at least a portion of it, where we're seeing things like, it's not just that you shall not commit adultery, but actually you shouldn't lust Because if you lust after women, then you've committed adultery in your heart. Or we see that you you heard that it was said, you shall not murder. But Jesus says, actually, even beyond that, we're not supposed to hate. Because when we do that, it's like we've murdered in our heart. And so, sin is more than even just those external things. And when we consider that, and we look at the, the law, then by God's design, the law leaves us hopeless and desperate. You say, this is supposed to be an encouraging message for Christmas Eve, is it not? Well, it is. You say, how can that be encouraging? My friends, the law leaves us at a place where we recognize that apart from a Savior, we are in a hopeless state. That there is no amount of moral improvement on our part that could ever meet God's standards of perfect righteousness. There is no way that we can just simply try harder. We're going to pull ourselves up our bootstraps and we're going to try harder and somehow we're going to be able to meet God's standards. The law says no. The law says we are hopeless apart from a Savior. And so tonight if you're here or if you're watching online and that's your strategy, I'm going to try really hard. I'm going to live a good life. I'm going to do things according to what I see as God's standard. The law says that we will fail. That we will fail. So are we doomed? No. Say, how is this a hopeful message again? Pastor Kevin, you lost me there. Because the law brings us to a state of hopelessness and desperation where we recognize that our only hope is for a Savior. And that Savior is Christ the Lord. And so in that sense then, the truth comes out in the text before us that faith is, is what is needed. That basically, it says the law has become our, our, our guardian or our tutor or whatever to point us or to lead us to Christ. Because unlike us, Jesus Christ did perfectly fulfill the law. He did perfectly fulfill God's righteous requirements. And not only that, 
This Savior who was born, that we celebrate, we sing, He was born, He's placed in a manger, and all these things that we celebrate, He came not just for that, but He came to die. He came to fulfill the law, and He came to die. He offered Himself in the place of sinners, in our place. Mark, you read this earlier from Titus chapter 2. Uh, the grace of God has, has uh, appeared, salvation to all men. This is glorious news because Christ has fulfilled the law. And then Christ died in the place of sinners and then he was resurrected. You say, well, that's Easter, Kevin. Well, I know, but Christmas leads to Easter, does it not? And I'm not just talking about because of the calendar goes from December, eventually it goes around to March or April. I'm saying the manger ultimately leads to the cross, which leads to the empty tomb, which says that there is hope for sinful people like us. You see, here's the hope of Christmas. The law says you're never going to meet God's standards. And my friends, that's true. That's exactly right. It leaves us in a place where we recognize by God's grace that our only hope is in the one who was born in Bethlehem, the Savior. And that's good news, my friends. So how should sinners respond to uh, the coming of Christ and His work? My friends, it's mentioned multiple times there in the text before us. In faith. In faith. The biblical command, which we know from uh, the book of Mark chapter 1, is repent and believe. Repent and believe. Leave our life of sin behind. Reject that sin. And look to Christ, the only one who can save in faith. The law says that we cannot save ourselves. We must reject a life of sin and call out to the only one who can save, and that is the Lord Jesus. You say, well, I'm already a believer. And in fact, I'm sure most of the folks who are gathered here this evening, maybe even watching online, are. So what are we supposed to do with this, Pastor Kevin? My friends... Just like the songs say, rejoice, rejoice. Uh, we're not singing this one tonight, but I thought of this as I was preparing this. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Right, yes, God with us, God with us. So what do we do as believers, my friends? When we close the service, we're, we're, we're going to start winding things down here shortly. We've got a couple songs that... Uh, um, Pastor Mark, there's a Christmas present for the church. Pastor Mark is going to lead us in a silent night and in joy to the world. So, so how do we respond? My friends, we can start by singing with true joy. Right? We celebrate. This is a time, uh, it's, a, it's a somber time when we, we have the candles and whatnot. And then after that, what do we sing? We sing joy to the world. What? Amen! We celebrate joy to the world. The Lord is come. We're no longer under the tutor. We're no longer under the prison master. We're free in Christ. Again, there, there's more to that. I don't want to oversimplify. But as we recall the good news of Christmas and how God has freed us, how He saved us, we rejoice. So what should your response be now? Sing with joy. Joy to the world, the Lord is... No! Sing out and worship Him with our voices tonight. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank You for the, the coming of Christ. We thank You that He has freed us from our sin. He has freed us from the penalty of our sin. Lord, we, we celebrate that tonight. We celebrate Your goodness and Your love and your, the sending of Your Son. We pray tonight that you would work in our hearts such that there would be true joy, contagious joy, Lord, not, not a contagious uh, disease or anything uh, as we're dealing with right now, but contagious joy, Lord, in the coming of Christ. And Father, we pray for one who may be watching or, or even in our presence tonight, who does not know that joy of Christ. Father, we pray that you would use 
your righteous standards, your law, to do the work in the heart of sinners. That they might see that there's no hope apart from your Son. God, we pray they would not stay in a place of despair or hopelessness, but that they too would join us in rejoicing in the coming of your Son. Thank you again, Lord, for your grace and your kindness to us, especially, especially in this time. So may you receive now uh, as an offering from us our, our worship as we sing your praises. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>